Hi, this is Shadi and today it's going to be a breakdown between Chico Rocano and Elio Gracie. Now, I've talked about these two multiple times uh, in stories, in challenges, little anecdotes here and there, uh, specifically the origins of techniques, uh, when it comes to Neiwaza, the throwing, etc., the guard. Uh, but this video, it's going to be a little bit different. We're going to be talking about their upbringing, also their philosophy and their approach to fighting. Now, these two, believe it or not, they have uh, a lot in common, but also they have uh, differences. So I figured this video is a great way to put everything just face to face and break it down in a way that it is understandable and also in a way that we can discuss the lives of these two that we might consider them as larger than life uh, individuals, so to speak. So uh, without any further ado, the first thing that we're going to be talking about is the upbringing. So the first one is going to be Kano Sensei. He was born on December 10th, uh, 1860 uh, in Japan. And he grew up in a very comfortable family, uh, somewhat affluent. His father owned a uh, sake brewing business. And since he was not the eldest son, he was not going to inherit it. So he had to go the traditional route, either open up his business or go to study, uh, find a job. So uh, it's tradition that really uh, made Kano the man who he is. And also uh, his father was a strict disciplinarian. So Kano grew up uh, very short uh, and also very frail. He was picked on and bullied a lot. Uh, throughout his childhood and he wanted to train simply because he wanted to defend himself and wanted to be more confident so uh, at the age of 17 he briefly started training jiu-jitsu but then again picked it up when he went to Tokyo to study in college he loved jiu-jitsu so much that uh, it was uh, far more interesting to him than his own studies so uh, he started like I said training uh, in college he started training in Tenshin Shinryu Jiu Jitsu under Iso uh, Sensei or Iso Shian and then later on he kept on studying and went into Kitoryu Jiu Jitsu under Ikubo Shihan. so he had a formal training in both Tenshin Shinryu and Kitoryu Jiu Jitsu. Here you see uh, the kata being performed. Um, there is also Koshiki no kata that is uh, from uh, Kitoryu, and you have the Itsutsu that's from Tenshin Shinryu. So a lot of them overlapped into judo as long as well as the techniques. So uh, he start and then he founded the Kodokan. 1882 as well as becoming a teacher and being involved in academics so he was a highly academic and theoretical man as well as a martial artist that wanted to be confident and defend himself now on the other hand you had elio gracie that was born on october 1st 1913 in belém brazil uh, contrary to popular belief uh, he was not frail or weak uh, as Crone said, my grandfather could not do a pull-up. Uh, that's a misconception. That's just a way to romanticize things. He was, however, a champion swimmer and a champion in rowing. So around the age of 16, close to Kano's age, he started to train uh, judo under his older brother, Carlos Gracie. Uh, Helio is the son of Gastao. He also comes from a very confident, uh, I'm sorry, comfortable family and affluent. Uh, his father, Gastao, owned a uh, like an entertainment business, the circus business, and through it, they met Maeda, and the whole thing with judo started with also, of course, uh, Jacinto Ferro and Donato Pires being tr their trainer in Rio de Janeiro after their move. Uh, from Belém do Pará for economical reasons. So uh, Helio was not frail whatsoever, but he did have uh, a comfortable life. He he grew up in a good, comfortable family, similar to uh, Kano. However, uh, do you hear the disciplinary things and being uh, how somewhat forced to make your own destiny in life? This is due to Japanese tradition. However, in the Brazilian tradition, this was not the case. Uh, Elio kept on training and he got his, uh, he started even teaching at a very early stage and even trained in catch wrestling under the famous Dudu. So, 
uh, they both grew up in good uh, families, but nonetheless, Helio uh, was not frail, and also he had his support when it came to training um, in both judo and uh, catch wrestling. So he was also a champion athlete while Kano was being a short, weak uh, teenager. Uh, he didn't even weigh 100 pounds. Uh, it, he was roughly estimated to be 99 pounds. So this will change a lot of things uh, in the future when we are discussing their approach to fighting and also their philosophies. So when it comes to philosophy, you had first uh, Kano Sensei. He was big on education. Now, uh, when he founded the Kodokan, he also started a career in education. He wanted to put uh, Japan on the map uh, when it comes to sports. He brought things to Japan like tennis, uh, baseball, um, and also he wanted to put them on the map in the world stage because they were going through the reform and they didn't believe that they were like a, a backwards people from being isolated for too many uh, centuries. So that was his main mission. So uh, jujitsu was a way and also the education. He believed in three types of education. The first one being the um, intellectual, moral, and then the physical. So combine all three and then add them to a discipline like, or I might say a dying discipline like jujitsu. And he uh, it was incredibly innovative and also a revolutionary because at the time, uh, practices like sumo, jujitsu, uh, they were starting to be looked at as backwards, and also, you know, the barbarians would train them uh, or retired samurais, the thugs, people were causing troubles on the street that would train jujitsu. However, Kano brought it back and said, like, hey, uh, we can do a lot of good things with this if we add the right mindset to it. And he added the values of education, moral education to be specific, because he himself was an academic. Not only that, he also structured jujitsu. Now the structure of the classes you have in uh, various martial arts and also the structure you have in techniques like teiwaza, nagewaza, shimewaza, neiwaza, so on and so forth. That was all done by Kano Sensei and thanks to his academic uh, background that helped preserve the art. Now, how many koryus or arts you see that First of all, they're not popular, and two, they were not uh, structured in a way that they are understood, but putting the techniques in these columns and these uh, creating this uh, judo tree of techniques, so to speak, and also adding uh, the values and the moral education, it created something that still exists till this day, thankfully. Now, Another thing is that he was not a competitor. So whenever the Kodokan had to prove themselves, he would send out his his students, uh, basically like Yamashita, you see here in front of you, um, Shiro Saigo, Sakujiro, Yokoyama, uh, Tomita, when it came to, uh, you know, putting out these judo demonstrations in the West. So the Four Guardians and many others, uh, one being... Um, Hajime Isogai, excuse me, who really crafted Neiwaza and added something that's very valuable in order to defend the Judo, to defend uh, the Kodokan, and also beat the Ground Master Matae Montanabe of Fozen Ryu. So he was not this uh, competitor. However, he did once do this demonstration that changed the world, in my opinion, because back in 1879, before the founding of the Kodokan, uh, the President of the United States back then, Ulysses Grant, uh, he was doing a world tour and went to Japan and they wanted to show the values of Jiu Jitsu, they wanted to keep it. So uh, Fukuda, if I'm not mistaken, that's the ancestor of Fukuda Keiko, the one who became the first and only female, a 10th Dan, and also his uh, sensei Iso, they did a demonstration. And also Kano and uh, his uh, training partner, they did Randori in front of the uh, President of the United States. And that story alone is uh, very impactful because the Randori was very much explosive and uh, incredibly appealing to the President that he wanted to take Jiu-Jitsu to the West. So even before founding the Kodokan, he was already contributing to spreading this uh, valuable art known as Jiu-Jitsu. Now... Elio Gracie on the second part, 
he was a competitor. He went out, he competed. Like I said, he had a tremendous athletic background of being a swimmer and a, a champion in rowing. So his cardio, his explosiveness, all that obviously uh, played well in his judo training. So when it comes to Helio, he went out and competed against other judokas like the Ono brothers, uh, like Kimura, and also uh, other people from Brazil from other disciplines like Capoeira uh, and many others and you know this was known as the Gracie challenge that went on uh, late into the 90s and finally you know showing their uh, their effectiveness in UFC in 1993 through Hoist Gracie you have also his son Hickson uh, showing uh, great uh, capabilities through his MMA record and also his Jiu Jitsu uh, ideals when it comes to the basics uh, preserving stuff from the old kodokan you can see it in his instructionals so the basics of judo and crafting them were uh, very important for someone like helio and hickson for someone that's constantly growing old uh, not going to uh, a lot of fancy stuff but nonetheless really sticking to the basics of kodokan uh, judo now i talked about kano sensei and his uh, importance of being uh, incredibly moral and uh, you know if you combine martial arts and morality and being an intellectual you will create a better human being and hence a better society but when it came to Helio Gracie it is uh, incredibly controversial uh, the topics that we talked about uh, in the past like uh, Hufino dos Santos uh, using the arm lock to cripple him uh, etc that would be uh, very much against what Kano sensei would talk about um, there is a uh, an article in the Gracie mag I will link it in the description he uh, here you're talking in old age or, or in his old age um, he he clearly shows some uh, pearls of wisdom and I would like to share them with you because they do reflect on the uh, Hufino dos Santos thing so for example he uh, he says something first of all he says never stop improving yourself I am 92 years old and it is hard to find a mind that works as fast as mine uh, I never had so much good sense in my life so uh, he talked about constantly uh, being uh, in a learning state because that will keep you sharp in life for example uh, old people when they don't want them to go senile or uh, let the Alzheimer's really take its place they teach them stuff like piano uh, they tell them to read books constantly, um, go out, do activities. So I'm sure the uh, judo that he did and uh, the jiu-jitsu or whatever uh, played a role in keeping him sharp all through these years. Now, when it comes to you know being fair and fighting and being moral, uh, he says this. He says, don't be unfair and don't fight without a reason. He says, one day a friend of mine came and said that a guy named Benigno was going to beat him up. To defend my friend, I went up to the guy and asked if he was the one who wanted to beat up my friend just before punching him in the face. So he was clearly looking to uh, uh, to go and uh, going for trouble basically and asking for a fight. Um, he says he hit me 20 times after that uh, and my face was a real mess. In the end, I realized that I had gotten a well-deserved beating. Uh, first lesson, be fair don't fight without a reason so uh the rufino dos santos thing happened in the early 1930s i believe in 1933 uh, so he had multiple lessons after that uh the famous one being 1951 uh, against kimura that's arguably in my opinion the beating of his life but uh through old age uh, if you continue and read um he says that you know with old age you mature you start to look back and see things uh differently so in a sense uh, he does look back and he's not the same man anymore like for example um the uh the german architect uh, of uh, the world war ii he says in albert Speer that got a very light sentence compared to what he had done uh at the end of the interview he says something incredibly disturbing he says that hmm, i'm glad i said those things uh because they got me a very light sentence meaning everything that he had done basically he has zero remorse but when looking back at this gracie article in the gracie mag uh it shows that he did mature with age uh and 
his uh, experiences with fighting like Kimura and here the, the Benigno incident uh, taught him a few things. So that's uh, good in my opinion. Now, there is two things that I want to discuss before I end this video. The first one being, um, in my opinion, without Kano, Jiu-Jitsu would have died a million years ago and there would be people would still be doing only like wrestling and kickboxing and savat and muay thai um but with kano with the 1879 demonstration the randori that he did with his friend and also the structure of the judo that he put especially the intellectual and moral part that really kept it alive now uh, he was not a big fan of Newaza and footlocks as history shows with the uh, Tsunetane Oda incident and also um, the uh, Hajime Isogai and the uh, Kanemitsu uh, Yaichiyoe and the Nibar. He was not a fan of these things so uh, or guard pulling so to speak but so Newaza at, right after World War II all these institutions started to lose uh, influence and Neniwaza started to become like on the back end of judo. We still practice it, but not as someone as going out uh, like in BJ, like the system that BJJ made uh, that really crafted and kept on uh, doing Neniwaza. But nonetheless, we only have so many hours in the day. So when you want to be a really masterful or a master in throwing, uh, Newaza naturally has to take a back end uh, and when it comes to self-defense he believed that stand-up is always first and I believe that is to be true but when it comes to the sports and the evolution of it especially on the ground uh, Helio Gracie or his family did uh, keep something that was otherwise be uh, on the back end or remotely being practiced like Kosen Judo or the Newaza that's uh, not limited in competition but we do practice it in class but not to the extent of bjj so in a sense there was a silver lining in that so both preserved a few things and also both grew up affluent one truly believed in morality one did not truly care all he wanted was to just win create the rules of the challenges by his own right and win as much as possible a bit machiavellian but with old age it seems that uh he started to show a few different uh perspectives i'll link the uh, uh article in the description below uh, if you have anything else to add please share it down below and also consider supporting me on patreon i have uh, some content just for the patrons alone uh, if you have anything else to add like i said share it down below this was shady and thank you for listening